particularly. Right? It's just not old school, which I love. But it's about time we get up off of that thing. Yes? I was out at Cal Jam. We had a life luncheon. And, um, or excuse me, a dinner. It was about twice the size of the number of people in this room. And Robert Kennedy was there. And he got up spontaneously, which if you know Robert Kennedy, I don't think there's much spontaneity in him. And this lawyer got up and started talking about the court case they have going on against the pharmaceutical industry for vaccines, right? And an entirely different approach. And made the comment that it's the first time that a federal judge has ever allowed a case to proceed because of how they presented it. There was so much information about the fraud that's been perpetuated on the American population. And then, of course, Dell Bigtree. How many people know Dell, right? Right, Dell got inspired, and Dell got up and did five minutes where the walls were vibrating. And I saw these 200 chiropractors, maybe less, in the course of the next half hour, get up and write checks for half of a million dollars to support the Children's Defense Fund to protect our children. Parents getting up one at a time, giving $1,000 each for every child they had in their family, realizing that their child was worth $1,000 in this kind of fight. So I know there's a lot of fight out there, but tonight I want to go a little bit different direction because whenever we see as chiropractors an opportunity for hope, we stand up, we open up our checkbooks, we get up off of that thing, and we get moving in life, yes? But tonight I want to celebrate. I want to celebrate. We talk about love and gratitude all the time, and then we sit around and talk about how few people we're seeing. We sit around and talk about how people are after us. And I understand we have those kinds of issues in life. But Walt Disney used to say, you ought to celebrate at least twice a week as a family and at least twice a week as a business. And someone said to me one time, don't you think that's a little excessive to have two celebrations a week as a family? Organized celebrations? You know how many times a day we say no to our kids? And we're talking about having two celebrations a week. So, I want to celebrate this. In a world that's so uncivil today, I love to see things that are beautiful that speak to the human spirit. Yes? Like giving a half a million dollars. I love to see things that speak to the human spirit. Um, the two on the right are obvious, the Eiffel Tower. Uh, the trees are a grove of trees in Japan. Uh, the one on the left, though, is kind of, you know, probably unknown to most people. Uh, in the San Diego airport, in the midst, in the midst of the chaos of people catching their flights and TSAs and Peter forgetting his passport and all of those kinds of things, the city of San Diego took a space with no return on investment hoped for, just a space that people can go into and experience art to stop and let their spirit be renewed. I love this, right? Food can even be art, can it, for some people? I love the picture in the middle. That's, that's cauliflower soup, just so you know. And that what this restaurant does is they have a forager. He goes out every day into the woods and forages greens and mushrooms and, I don't know, stuff. And then he brings it in the restaurant and they turn it into food. So if you look at the uh, soup, and it's, I know it's a little far away, you'll see a lot of little green dots all lined up perfectly in the middle of that soup. That centrifuge basil. And then there's a drop of centrifuge cauliflower on the top of each one of those dots. And then there's caviar in the middle and a leaf of gold, which you get to eat. How great is it to eat gold, right? A leaf of gold laying on top of it. And they make that just one at a time for people that come in as an expression of what? Of the passion that they have on the inside, right? I really love the thing on the right, the rose. Right, the bamboo and the rose, it's about this high, by the way, in real life. Every inch of that thing is made out of chocolate. Ooh, that's an evening, right? That's an evening. And this guy, I love this guy. This guy they put in an airplane in different cities in the world, and they take him in a slow-flying airplane, and they fly him over a city once, and he just sits and looks out the window, and then he sits down and over the next couple of months, in this case, it's Mexico City, and reproduces the entire city from having seen it only once from an airplane. Every building, and if you check the buildings, every building has the right number of floors, exactly the right number of windows, they're all proportionately correct, 
the right number of streets, they're all the right length, and they just flew him over a city one time, which talks to me about what's possible for the human spirit. This is our art, isn't it? This is our art. Isn't this what we get up and deal with every day? It's not food, it's not photography, it's not a building, you know, in the San Diego airport. We get up every day and we get to deal with this, right? This is our art. This is where people come to us for what we do. Wouldn't you agree? I love this quote from Kermit, one of the great philosophers of all time. He said, uh, when you're getting ready to take a test and everyone starts using a ruler, but you thought the answer was Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> right? Sometimes it's not what it appears to be. Right? We have a different lens on the world. Wouldn't you agree? We have a different lens on the world. And that lens, that lens that we have on the world dictates a different way of viewing it and therefore a different sets of behavior inside of it. You, you follow me? So our lens looks something like this. It says living things are intelligent. They're self-developing. They're self-adapting. They're self-healing. That the nerve system controls function and adaptation. This is our story, folks. That if you damage the nervous system, it produces malfunction. Diseases reduce quantity and quality of life. We know there are three damages to the nerve system. Physical traumas, emotional stresses, and environmental toxins. And one of those, one of the most pathological and epidemic on our planet is subluxation. And our job as chiropractors, I see it, is two things. One, clinically to correct the subluxation, preaching to the choir today. But in educating people about the bigger picture of chiropractic, it causes them to alter their lifestyle and see the world differently. You follow me? They see a vaccine differently. They see a drug differently. They see what they put in their body differently. Not that it's chiropractic, not that it's my job to take care of those things, but it is my job to educate them to this bigger picture, this story, so they can clean up all the other negative interferences to their nervous systems and their life per their motivation. Yes, everyone agree? Absolutely. They're going to see childbirth not as a frightening thing. They're going to see childbirth as a natural thing through our lens. You got it? We have a different lens. They pulled out a ruler. We think the answer is Abraham Lincoln. And because of that, because of that, by the very nature of what we do, we have a fight going on all the time, don't we? River told me one day a couple of months ago, guys, time to pick a fight. But he didn't mean like go out and pick a fight where there's losers. He meant go out and live what we live. And in the process of doing that, our lens conflicting with other people's lenses causes us what? To have a fight going on, a fight on our hands. You follow me? The great thing about our fight is our fight is carried out with love and gratitude. And when people get it, there are no victims in our war, you follow me, except the ones that don't get it. You follow me? It's time to pick a fight. So here are the tools we deal with every day. I love this x-ray, right? This is from my chiropractor, Roy Sweat. You ever want to be adjusted by a master in chiropractic? Go find somebody like Roy Sweat, yes? Right, the AO guy? This is the pre-x-ray that I pulled out of one of his files. I took 10 files out one day and said, Roy, can I just look at the x-rays? Randomly pulled out 10 files. They all look pretty much like this. This is the pre-x-ray. That's the post-x-ray. With an eight, eight pound tap on the atlas vertebra. By the way, the length of time between the first x-ray and the second x-ray, anybody want to guess? What's that? Four hours. Four hours between the first x-ray and the second x-ray after getting your atlas tapped. And of course, this is what it shows up as in life, right? This is the state of New Hampshire. State of New Hampshire has to pay the, for their state employees to have health care. So since they're paying, they're going to keep track of how much money they spend. In the state of New Hampshire in 2014, absent chiropractic care, they spent almost $7,000 per state employee for health care in the state. If chiropractic was anywhere in the equation, not the only thing, not the primary thing, not respective of philosophy, not depending on what school you went to. If chiropractic was just anywhere in the equation of that person's life during that year, the cost for that group of patients dropped to $2,000 per year for the employee. 
And since opioids are such a big issue, absent chiropractic care in the state of New Hampshire, they spend an average of $921 per person in New Hampshire on opioids. If chiropractic, again, was anywhere in the equation, they spent $200 per person on the average for opioid care. Volume, can I get some volume? Thank you. Oh! Oh! People with type 2 diabetes are excited about the potential of once-weekly Ozempic. In a study with Ozempic, a majority of adults lowered their blood sugar and reached an A1C of less than 7 and maintained it. Oh! Under 7? And you may lose weight. In the same one-year study, adults lost on average up to 12 pounds. Oh, up to 12 pounds? A two-year study showed that Ozempic does not increase the risk of major cardiovascular events like heart attack, stroke, or death. Oh, no increased risk? Oh, oh! Ozempic should not be the first medicine for treating diabetes or for people with type 1 diabetes or diabetic ketoacidosis. Do not share needles or pens. Don't reuse needles. Do not take Ozempic if you have a personal or family history of medullary thyroid cancer, multiple endocrine neoplasia syndrome type 2, or if you are allergic to Ozempic. Stop taking Ozempic and get medical help right away if you get a lump or swelling in your neck, severe stomach pain, itching, rash, or trouble breathing. Serious side effects may happen, including pancreatitis. Tell your doctor if you have diabetic retinopathy or vision changes. Taking Ozempic with a sulfonylurea or insulin may increase the risk for low blood sugar. Common side effects are nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, stomach pain, and constipation. Some side effects can lead to dehydration, which may worsen kidney problems. Some side effects can... They think it's a ruler, we think it's a what? Abraham Lincoln. You follow me? You know why they probably don't have any commercials about chiropractic? There's no side effects. What would they do, right? What would they tell you to avoid? But here's the, here's the advantage, right? Here are the benefits. This is a 15-year-old kid from Alaska, hockey player, basketball player, got hit in the chest, his feet went out from under him, landed violently on the back of his head, had a vestibular concussion, obviously massive subluxation, had the normal symptoms that you'd have with concussion for a period of time. About three weeks worth of headaches, throwing up, lapses in memory, lack of coordination. One of the two big things that happened to him was he lost his ability to speak. And after three months, the MDs told him it was permanent. He also lost his ability to be able to coordinate and play. In fact, he couldn't walk up a set of stairs without stopping halfway up and resting before he could get to the top of the stairs. And that's three months later after all the symptoms were gone. His dad, and I'm gonna talk about this in a moment, his dad, because of Sports Illustrated and Sidney Crosby being on the front of it, and Sidney Crosby telling his story about chiropractic, his dad in Alaska decided he was gonna to come to Life University and put his kid under chiropractic care. So, Remember now, he hasn't spoken a word in over three months. This is two days into chiropractic care with Jesse. V. You ever seen a father cry? So the first thing that had come out of his mouth in over three months. And here he is four days into chiropractic care. Thanks for the new exercises. They've been working pretty well. FaceTime me next week. And since he was a basketball player, we sent him to see the Atlanta Hawks, right, play. He'd never seen a professional basketball game. Um, and we got him all set up because we know some people on the Hawks. So we had him go meet the players. The players signed stuff for him, all of that. He came back the next day. This is the picture he brought back. That's called 15-year-old hormones. We knew he was on the right track when he brought this back instead of pictures of the players, right? And so along with his chiropractic care, correcting his cervical curve, getting his atlas straightened out, they gave him some exercises to start right, exercising see. his brain. And here he is. Hey, Dr. Ryan, woke up feeling pretty good today. Uh, just gonna keep getting better and just wanted to say thanks. It's what we do, yes? It's what we do.
How many people in this room have been impacted by Chuck Ribley? Um, I'm going to ask that of students at an assembly in a couple of weeks. Uh, my guess is a lot of them don't even know who he is, right? Guy on the board, all of that. Um, and I'm going to tell them, let them know that every single one of them is impacted by Chuck Ribley. Because Chuck Ribley walked on a beach with 13 other guys, one of them being Dr. Sid Williams, in Ormond, Florida, and they decided to start a chiropractic school in Atlanta, Georgia. So every student that's gone through that school has been impacted by the decision those people made on that beach that day. Wouldn't you agree? But I have to tell you something, it goes really much, much deeper than that. Way deeper. Um, my grandson, who's in his second year, finished up his second year of college, uh, is getting ready to start chiropractic school. Right? It's the greatest thing ever. If you've ever had any kids tell you they're going to be chiropractors, it is the greatest moment in your life. It's like your whole life has been validated, right, when they do that. Yes, it's an amazing experience when that happens. So Ty's going to come to chiropractic. In fact, some of you saw him a couple of years ago when uh, Jim was gracious enough in the group here to hand me an award, a uh, Lifetime Achievement Award. I thought I was supposed to retire after that. You know, how many, you know, do you get two of those in the course of a lifetime? I don't know. And I saw my grandson get up and talk, and he was so articulate. It just amazed me. And um, he's going to be impacted by River when he goes to chiropractic school. You follow me? But what's really interesting is uh, one of River's sons is opening up a practice, he and his wife in Atlanta. And my son-in-law and my daughter, uh, and my daughter's a chiropractor, my son-in-law is a chiropractor in San Diego, and they coach and manage 37 chiropractic offices. They either own them or they're in their group and they manage them called 100% chiropractic. And so there's going to be a connection between the Ribley family, right, that's one person removed from River, and my family, one person removed from me. And they have certain things in common, which is why they found each other and why we're impacted by someone like uh, Chuck. Um, one of the things they have in common is this lens that I'll just call vitalism, which, by the way, you do know that that got introduced in 1976 in a philosophy class at Sherman College of Chiropractic by me and Doug Gates, right? We were sitting around. We were looking for a way of expressing to the outside world, not to chiropractors, but to the outside world, we were looking for a way of expressing principle number one, that there's an intelligence in all matter that continually gives to it all of its properties and actions, thus maintaining it in existence. And while most of science won't look at that principle in chiropractic, we found the principle of vitalism uh, put together by some philosophers in Marseille, France, um, back at a time when they were fighting reductionism. They were trying to say that in order to understand life, you couldn't look at it as a cell or an atom. You had to look at it in the context of the whole. That all of life collectively, which is a point I'm making to you right now, hang with me, all of life is intelligent. It's self-developing, self-maintaining, and self-healing. And so in a class uh, one day with David Koch sitting in it and Arnaud Bernier and uh, a number of other people, we introduced this notion of vitalism. Uh, of course, vitalism went underground because since it couldn't be and couldn't be documented uh, in a way that was in a reductionistic scientific way, uh, they pushed it over into the spiritual realm. And if you look up the word vitalism in the dictionary, it says it's a philosophy in scientific cuts. But it resurfaced, right? Because in today's world, in the quantum world, we begin to recognize that all of us, every one of us in this room, everything we do every day is connected in some way. And when we do good things, the world is better. When we do bad things and have bad thoughts, the world is impacted by that. And the world is a collection of the culture of each one of us and how we live our lives individually. And vitalism expresses that. And of course, today, you can get a PhD in vitalism at Michigan State University or the University of Oxford in England. Uh, and more accurately today, it's called neo-vitalism. You follow me? And it recognizes a couple of things. One is 
that we're self-developing, self-healing, and self-maintaining, it also recognizes that the planet, any living thing, is intelligent and self-developing and self-maintaining and self-healing. And of course, the thing we draw from that is something of that nature you don't need to manipulate and get side effects, which always happens when you manipulate the organism, whether it's the person or the world. But when you remove interferences, in fact, what you get are no side effects, right? There are no side effects of taking pesticides out of somebody's food. And by the way, as a side note, the number one laden food with Roundup, they say don't eat it anymore, is kale, just so you know. It is the number one food on the planet that holds on to Roundup. I hate kale anyway, so that was a great, <laughs> great thing for me. But there's another part to neo-vitalism. It says, that the universe is conscious, it's intelligent. And one thing we know, the axiom of all conscious or intelligent organisms, they're always striving to gain higher and higher levels of awareness, to become aware of themselves and aware of their environment. Sorry. You just got to love social media, don't you? That's okay. Watch, you and I, our species, we are on a trip to gain higher and higher levels of awareness, as is the planet. And every time you gain higher levels of awareness, Abraham Lincoln, humanity, the world, gains more consciousness about itself. You follow me? It evolves. So when Jason and Vanessa are working with River Sun and they grow and their practices becomes more and more successful and they educate more and more people, then all of us are impacted by that. And it goes even deeper than that, right? It goes even deeper than that. River, just so you know, when he graduated from school in 1960, had to, like I had to, go state to state to get a license. There were no national boards. And so if you wanted to practice in Michigan, you had to go to Michigan and sit for that license. If you wanted to practice in Oregon, you had to go to Oregon and sit in that license. And a few states had reciprocity, but it wasn't across the country. You follow me? The problem was that almost every one of these states had what were known as medical basic science boards. And they were all made up of MDs, and basically, they were part one of national board. They gave you an exam in anatomy and physiology, in diagnosis and pathology. And once you passed the medical basic science board, then you could sit your specialized board, dentistry, medicine, chiropractic, behind the basic science board. So in New Mexico, which was known as one of the easier states to get through the basic science exam, to get to the chiropractic exam so you could take the test, that what happened was these medical boards were used, even though there was a licensure for chiropractic in every state, essentially, not all of them, but essentially, these basic science boards were used to keep chiropractors from ever taking the exam. They were all essays, they were all subjectively graded, and every now and then they lit a dribble of one or two chiropractors through to sit for the chiropractic licensure behind the basic science exam, except for one place, and that was in New Mexico. And in New Mexico, the governor, having seen the disparity of this, had appointed a chiropractor, the only one ever in the history of the world, appointed a chiropractor to sit on the basic science exam board along with the other five or six MDs. And this chiropractor actually gave the pathology exam. And so chiropractors knew when they graduated from school you could go to New Mexico, and as long as you knew your stuff, you had a shot of getting past the basic science board and getting a license, which then you could use in other states through reciprocity. You follow me? And River was one of those. He went to New Mexico. He sat the exam a couple of times, got through the exam, went to Michigan, and the rest is history, right? Tens of thousands of patients who reached out to tens of thousands of their family and friends, walking on a beach in Ormond, Florida, 
having sons that practice chiropractic. Sat on the board at Life University. I remember them calling, Jerry Clum calling me up after I had left Palmer about three days later and said, hey, would you fly to Michigan and sit down in Detroit with some people from the board and have a conversation about coming to life? I said, sure. And I flew in, and eight hours later, River asked me a question. He said, if you came to life, would you be coming to, to help save Life University, or would you be coming to use Life University for chiropractic? And I said, you know what, River, I could love life, but I love chiropractic way more. I'm coming for chiropractic. He goes, right answer, you're hired. And altered the direction of my life. And recently he got up at a board meeting, and he had a revelation recently. He was thinking back to the exam that he took in New Mexico that started this, that caused all of you in this room to raise your hand today about how he's impacted your life. And he thought about the chiropractor sitting on that board, and he remembered this was him. Hey, doctor. That's my dad. That's my dad, Al Reekman. And River remembered my dad, giving him the pathology exam and opening up the door for him to get a license to practice chiropractic. You know what? We are all connected, folks. We are all connected in life. And the decisions we make every day when we go to our practice with anger and retribution and hate affects the world in a different way than when we go with love and compassion and tolerance and forgiveness and reconciliation. Who are we? How do we show up? If we win the fight that we're about to pick, at the end of the fight, at the end of the fight, if we've gained it through anger and retribution, what would we have really gained for the world? At the end of the fight, who are we going to be in the middle of this fight? And it's determined by who we are day in and day out. The devil whispered in my ear, you are not strong enough to withstand the storm. Today I whispered in the devil's ear, I am the storm. I am the storm. Congratulations. Thank you for allowing me to come here and celebrate for 20 minutes. We love you. We love you from the bottom of our hearts. We are connected to you in ways that you and I will never understand except maybe 50 years later when we realized that we had a connection somewhere along the way. Thanks. Guy Reekman, the Chancellor.